Hello everyone, this meeting is being recorded and if you consent to this, please type yes in the text chat and if you do not consent, we may ask you to leave and watch the recordings later on. Uh, hello everyone and thank you for coming to this webinar session brought to you by Belta and with the support of Hype Filth and Let's Talk Online. Uh, my name is Manu van Loon and I am an intern for Belta, Belta, the Belgian English Language Teachers Association. Belta's aim is to encourage professional development through bringing English language professionals in Belgium to, uh, together to discuss the things that matter to them. We also want to connect Belgian teachers to the wider world of ELT. And that's why we offer this webinar series. Uh, where we can bring our members together with teachers from all, all around the world to watch presentations from international speakers. So, hello to our members and to those of you joining us from around the world. Uh, before I introduce this month's speaker, I would like to remind all the Belta members, Belgian professionals and other professionals, that the annual Belta Day will be held in, uh, on the second, uh, 22nd of March 2014 in Brussels. Uh, if you want more information, please check out uh, the conference page in the, on the Delta website, www.deltabelgium.com. We have a great lineup of speakers and hope you can join us. In this month's webinar, we are joined by Joe Dale, who will be discussing how to use iPad applications to create digital stories in the ESL classroom. Joe Dale is an independent consultant who works with a range of organizations, including Network for Languages, the British Council, and the BBC. He is the host of the TES NFL Forum and a regular conference speaker. Uh, he is a recognized expert on technology and language learning. And you can learn all about Joe and his passions by visiting www.joedale.typefacts.com his blog, which has been nominated for four Eddie Blogs Awards. We are pleased that Joe is willing to share some of his expertise with us today. So now I give you Joe Dale. Thank you, Malu. That's very kind of you. OK, welcome, everyone, to the webinar. Um, we have about uh, 55 minutes together. And I uh, hope you're going to find it very useful. Uh, I'm sure by the end of it, your brains will have exploded, hopefully not literally. But uh, I'd much rather you were uh, uh, you had your brains exploded than you were bored. So um, let's make a start. This is my first slide. So as you can see, uh, we're going to be talking about digital storytelling uh, using, um, uh, in particular, iPad apps. But I will be also referring to web tools that you can use as well. If you don't have an iPad, uh, you can use that on a, on a laptop, on a Mac machine, uh, etc. Uh, my blog address, which Malou has just uh, mentioned, is here: joedale.typepad.com. And my email address is joedell at talk21.com. So if there's anything that you want to ask me um, after today's session, then feel free to contact me. I'm also joedell on Twitter as well. So very easy to find. OK, so let's make a start. We're talking about digital storytelling with uh, the use of iPad apps and web tools, but particularly iPad apps. OK, so I thought it would be useful to start off with by looking at a definition of what a digital story is. So this is one that I found online. You can see that. Uh, underneath, uh, at the bottom of this slide, I've got a link to uh, the reference. And you'll notice that in most of the slides that I'll be showing you today, um, there will, there's a link to where you can find out more information. Uh, I'm going to have my webcam on during the presentation, so um, you can actually see my face while I'm talking. And uh, some people seem to like uh, As you can see, it says that a short uh, that, that a digital story is a short first-person video narrative created by combining recorded voice, still, and moving images, and music or other sounds. stories, and I think for language learning, I think this is this is really really important. Just to, just to mention, my background is modern foreign language teaching. So I was a French teacher for 13 years, and since 2009, uh, I've been a an independent languages consultant. Um, so I think that in language learning, digital storytelling is a win-win is a situation because it's so easy nowadays to create interesting digital content incorporating multimedia using an iPad or using uh, a laptop, a Mac, etc. And so I think that uh, digital storytelling is, is, a, is a perfect fit for enhancing language learning and producing 
multimedia creative outcomes. Okay, so if you're not really sure where to start with uh, digital storytelling, these are some of the ideas behind uh, the sorts of um, uh, activities you can be doing. You could be creating uh, comics, multimedia posters, uh, narrated slideshows, photo stories, uh, digital postcards, cartoons, podcasts, videos, and ebooks. So these are some of the things we're going to be looking at today with specific examples and also with, with specific apps and web tools that you can use to get started with this sort of thing. Okay, this is a useful uh, image, I think, from the point of view that it's suggesting from, a, um, from an educational point of view how digital storytelling uh, can uh, help uh, enhance teaching and learning. So you can see on the left-hand side, for example, it's suggesting that digital storytelling is a, a good way of promoting 21st century skills, such as uh, cultural literacy, digital literacy, information literacy, etc., etc. It's a good way of engaging students with, uh, uh, with relevant, up-to-date uh, ideas. So in other words, uh, students who are doing this sort of thing in their own time, we're able to allow them to create these interesting digital resources in class as a way of enhancing their language learning. So we're not allowing them to power down to, uh, before they come into the classroom. We're allowing them to embrace interesting digital tools and apps in order to enhance their, their learning and make their, their learning relevant for the 21st century. So again, you can see you, you've got the link here, which you can uh, click on and have a look in your own time. OK, this uh, reference is particularly uh, referring to language learning. And uh, I found this by uh, two US educators, Marlene John Choi and uh, Cassie Sharber. Uh, and as you can see, they are suggesting that digital storytelling uh, not only uh, improves language acquisition, but it also enhances uh, all four skills of reading, writing, speaking, and listening. I really can't emphasize that, uh, that strongly enough. I think that with movie making, with, uh, with audio recording, the whole sort of collaborative nature of creating the task in the first place, of scripting it, of working out what you're going to do, of storyboarding it, and actually, uh, uh, producing the content, producing the movie, producing a podcast and editing it uh, and what have you and then publishing it to a real audience is, 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 a, is a great way of, uh, of reinforcing understanding, of, of improving pronunciation, uh, of, uh, of embedding meaning and then when you're publishing the content to a real audience it means that you're publishing to, uh, yeah, you, so you're, you're engaging the students in the fact that you're publishing their work to a real audience and that, that's also a win-win situation. It's so easy nowadays to publish content online. Uh, digital storytelling is, is an obvious thing, I think, to promote, to improve uh, uh, not just learning, but language learning in particular. And again, you've got reference here to cultural competencies, 21st century skills, and the things that I've talked about already. OK, now before you start, I think it's very, very important that you think about uh, what is the purpose of your uh, the use of uh, multimedia. Why are you trying to use uh, multimedia to en enhance a learning outcome? so that you're taking, let's say, traditional methodology and you're, you're enhancing it with the technology in the 21st century. What is the purpose of doing that? Who are you trying to uh, uh, appeal to? Who, who is your audience? Uh, and yes, there is a, a potentially a worldwide audience out there, but in a way, I would suggest that the most important audience to start off with is actually the local audience within your school. So once you've created, let's say you've got a blog and you're publishing um, videos or podcasts or what have you onto that blog, uh, I would suggest that through personal experience that the best thing to do to start off with is to encourage as many people as possible from the school and the, and, uh, the relatives of the, uh, of the students at the school to, to look at the blog, to check it out, to watch videos that are being produced by the students and to nurture that, um, that local audience. And then um, I'm sure that you'll get a much wider audience, particularly if the teacher involved with, the, uh, with, the, with, the, with uh, delivering the lesson is connected on Twitter and uh, puts a tweet out there encouraging um, their followers to leave uh, comments on the blog and what have you. And that's a really fantastic way of promoting digital storytelling. And then clearly the content is, is key. Once you've thought about the purpose and the audience, what is the content that you're covering in the curriculum that you want to um, have enhanced through, through the, the process of digital storytelling? I am checking on the chat on the right hand side, but I can see there aren't any questions so far. So I'm presuming you can hear me fine and everything's going okay. Okay. Right, now, um, I've talked a lot in different presentations about Bloom's taxonomy, and I think right at the top of Bloom's taxonomy, uh, of the, the creating level is really, really important in relation to digital storytelling. Now, this um, particular uh, post was uh, created by Rob Ellis, who actually lives um, on the Isle of Wight, which is where I live right now in England, uh, and I hope everyone knows uh, where that is. Um, 
and he's uh, he's done a very useful uh, diagram in relation to the different levels of Bloom's taxonomy. And then underneath, he's got various web tools. Uh, so not iPad apps at this point, but web tools which can be used to enhance digital storytelling to um, uh, to achieve the different levels of the Bloom's taxonomy. But I think um, the most important level is the creating level, and um, as I've said at the beginning of this presentation, it's so easy now to create content using digital tools, using apps, that that's exactly what we should be trying to do to achieve those higher levels, to achieve those uh, higher, higher order thinking skills. We need to be trying to encourage the children to create content, create professional looking multimedia content. Not all the time, uh, maybe um, at the end of a unit, let's say, to show that they've understood um, everything. So a fantastic way of revising to make the outcome memorable. Um, or, or during the um, uh, during let's say a six week um, term, uh, six week half term where you could incorporate digital storytelling and then maybe finish with a bigger project. So um, I think creating is very very important, and I'm going to touch more on that um, later on. Now this next um, graphic, this was created by Sylvia Tolisano, who is Languages uh, on Twitter, and she has an amazing uh, blog all about uh, uh, learning with iPad. So I'd really encourage you to check her out, Sylvia Tolisano. Uh, who, she's currently living in Brazil, um, in uh, Sao Paulo, and uh, this graphic uh, I think is very, very useful. This is adapted from the original work of Kathy Schrock, who I was lucky enough to see in uh, Boston at the um, uh, iPad Summit USA uh, in November of last year, so only a couple of months ago. And uh, again, you've got the different levels of Bloom's taxonomy, but what you have here is you have different apps which uh, relate to the different levels. So if you're a, a beginner to iPads, then these apps could be a very, very useful starting point. So as you can see, you've got Audio Boo, which is good for uh, creating instant podcasts. Uh, you've got iMovie for creating films and editing them. Comic Books, obviously, for creating comics. Uh, Sonic Pics for narrated slideshows. Puppet Pals for um, animation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, right at the top of Bloom's Taxonomy, that creating level, these apps allow you to uh, produce really cool multimedia uh, outcomes uh, to help your students enhance language learning. Okay, um, the next three slides are in relation to uh, useful resources for finding out about uh, good iPad apps to enhance language learning uh, in general, uh, some of which refer to digital storytelling, but I thought that you'd find this useful as well, which is why I put this in. Now, this is a wiki uh, which was created by Kristen Paul, who is a, um, a languages advisor for um, uh, South Australia government in the uh, in Australia, obviously, and she has put this wiki together over uh, quite a few uh, years now, and it has it's a really good starting point um, for good apps for enhancing language learning. So as you can see uh, from the graphic, you've got um, good apps for promoting oral skills, writing skills, um, listening skills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so again, I would uh, encourage you to have a look at that particular resource because it is really fantastic. I was lucky enough to stay with uh, Kristen a couple of times since I've, uh, I've uh, visited Australia in 2012 and 13 and done work there. And surprisingly, uh, after our visit, um, there were one or two more apps that were added to, um, to the wiki. So uh, I think it's really fantastic. It's a labor of love that uh, um, Kristen has done there, and it's, it's well worth checking out for sure. Uh, this is another um, good resource. This is a uh, uh, oops, let me go back a sec. Right, this is another fantastic resource. This is a blog uh, which was uh, created or has been created by a language teacher called uh, Joyce Tabone. That's T A B O N E. Joyce Tabone, who is a language teacher from Melbourne in Australia, and uh, although she hasn't updated it since August of last year, uh, she's done quite a few posts on individual apps and said and said how she thought they would be useful in for enhancing language learning. So again, I'd encourage you to have a look at that. That's uh, those two resources from Australia are really fantastic. Uh, and in general, I think that um, it's a good idea also to connect with people like Joyce and like uh, Kirsten, um, uh, Kristen, sorry, online on Twitter, and uh, not only um, see what they're doing by their blogs and their wikis, but also connect with them and have conversations with them about the sorts of apps that they would recommend. You can also get in contact with me, of course, and uh, lots of other people who. Uh, or I know into this sort of uh, this sort of thing. Okay, now this is um, a uh, another resource. This is by Catherine Uslan, who is a language teacher from um, from America, and she has got an amazing website uh, to do with uh, digital tools. And this one is particularly looking at iOS apps. So you, again, you'll see that in the middle at the top here it actually says storytelling, 
but I thought I'd do a screenshot of this uh, this first page, as it were. So again, that's a really good way of uh, of checking out uh, good apps which are being uh, promoted by language uh, educators. So again, uh, some of these relate to digital storytelling, and other uh, other ones relate to other uh, useful apps. And you can see underneath as well, it says resources and research. These are other uh, US educators, I think, in general, uh, who are language teachers who are promoting the use of iPads in the classroom. So uh, that should keep you busy anyway for the time being. OK, so again, if you're not really sure of some, some good tools, uh, not just web tools, but also apps as well, to help you get started with digital storytelling, I thought I would create a Wordle, uh, including some apps, some web tools that are tried and tested around the world uh, for using digital storytelling to promote language learning. So again, uh, if you don't, uh, if, you, if, this is, if this is something you're new, you're new to, then this could be a good uh, place to start to uh, to just to Google these different terms, and you'll find uh, some some great resources to use in your um, in your schools to enhance um, digital storytelling and language learning as a result. Okay, now uh, this gentleman here, this is Dr. Uh, Felix Cronenberg, and he is a professor from the uh, from the US. Uh, who is particularly interested in digital storytelling. So his background is is, um, uh, is a language educator. And this slide and the, and the next slide are two uh, presentations that you can watch. Uh, you've got the link at the bottom of each of the slides. And this was um, uh, the done for SWALT, S-W-A-L-L-T, which is a regional uh, language organization. And um, Felix has done lots and lots of interesting work in relation to digital storytelling, very um, creative work. So again, if you click on that link, you can watch his webinar. That's the great thing about webinars, you can watch them as many times as you want, and you'll learn lots of interesting things, uh, such as, for example, using Google Earth, which I'm going to refer to uh, later on. So again, a, a fantastic resource. Now the next one, this is uh, LARC, which is uh, the Language uh, Acquisition uh, Research Center. Uh, in San Diego University, and um, uh, as you can see, uh, Felix took part in a workshop in 2011, again talking about digital storytelling. There is repeated content from some some of the presentations repeated from that uh, that presentation compared to the one that I showed you a moment ago. But there's lots of new stuff as well. Um, I've been lucky enough to uh, have been asked by um, Evan Rubin, who is the person who organises the uh, the social media workshop. Uh, I've been asked three times now to do different presentations, so I've done things on blogging and, and, and web tools and what have you. But this one is to do with digital storytelling, and again, it's got some really interesting ideas. Now, uh, for those people that don't know about LARC, uh, it's always in August, um, normally the sort of, well, sorry, it's the end of July, start of August, depending on exactly when it's going to be, but it's always around that type of year, a uh, time of year, and um, uh, it's, it's a free, uh, it's a free, uh, uh, conference, I suppose you would say. It's a five-day conference, and you're able to watch the webinars. It's completely virtual, there, um, it's, it's, uh, and it's completely free as well. And there are lots of different internationally renowned uh, presenters talking about technology and language learning. And so I would really encourage you to, to check it out. And you can also check out all the different uh, archives from, I think the first one was 2010, was the first conference that he did of the first workshop. And uh, all, the, all those webinars are still available for free for you to access if you're interested. OK, this is um, a, a web uh, page from Sylvia Duckworth, who's a French teacher from Toronto, called eTools for Language Teachers. And again, these are web tools, not apps, web tools which uh, allow you to promote the use of digital storytelling in languages. So again, uh, I thought that would be a good resource to include for you. OK, this is from, uh, from Ireland, um, and uh, this is for primary languages. And again, you've got uh, an introduction to digital storytelling. Uh, so you've got lots of online tools uh, suggested are good for digital storytelling. So again, that's a good resource for you to, you to check out. I will just turn Skype off, actually, I think, just quickly. And so I don't get any more pop-ups. OK, uh, let's carry on. Right, now this is um, from Catherine Ritz. This is a presentation that she did back in 2011. Uh, I think it was for the ACTFOR conference, but I may be wrong about it. Yeah, I think it would be because it was November 2011, so that would be when ACTFOR takes place. So for those people that don't, don't know what ACTFOR is, it's the American Council of Teachers of Foreign Languages. And, um, and uh, this is a presentation all about digital storytelling. I'm going to show you a, an example of one of the slides in a moment. 
but again this is a good resource for you to for you to check out in your own time uh, this is um, one specifically for ELT uh, this is uh, a, a sort of a guide that I found uh, recently uh, called digital storytelling in the foreign language classroom so you can see here uh, it's a it's a, it's a resource full of uh, interesting ideas from Middlesex University you can have a look at in your own time to get some ideas on, on where to get started with this okay these are two guides um, about digital storytelling the first one is by Sylvia Tolosano who I've mentioned already and the one on the right hand side is from Microsoft they've produced quite a few different uh, web tools which are free to download and install uh, on your machine uh, which are good for digital storytelling such as uh, Photo Story 3 as well as other tools and uh, again you've got the links there to where you can find out more information now the storytelling guide by Sylvia Tolosano that is quite old now it's 2009 but uh, lots of the uh, the ideas and the themes are very relevant still I think but it's just a question of um, applying the same ideas but with iPad apps and I'm going to give you lots of iPad apps uh, later on on how you can use some of the ideas so for example creating movies creating comics and that sort of thing but just using more uh, up-to-date um, applications for doing this um, because I think that's very important there was a um, uh, an expression going around from uh, Mark Prensky who's a well-known US educator uh, and consultant talking about the idea we should concentrate on the on the verbs and not on the nouns in other words the nouns are the tools or the apps and the verbs are things like um, collaboration uh, creating uh, sorry collaborating creating um, uh, uh, etc etc so we should concentrate on the verbs and not on the nouns and so the, the nouns are important the tools are important but what's more important is um, the way the pedagogy the way in which digital storytelling can enhance language learning and we'll look at more of that in detail um, um, in a moment okay so here's an example from um, Catherine Ritz's um, presentation that I just referred to so as you can see here she's using a cartoon she's using a tool called Toon Do but if you were using an iPad you could use uh, something like Comic Life or a strip designer which I'm going to talk uh, more about in a moment and you can see this as a Spanish example uh, in order to promote creative writing and so Toon Do is a free tool uh, anybody can use it it won't work on the iPad because of the um, it needs flash but you could use it on a laptop or a, or a Mac and what have you and so that's a great way of, of promoting creative writing by using cartoons and normally most students like cartoons so that's a really really good idea I can see my Skype still running but never mind I'll just leave it now okay right now this was uh, another example of using uh, cartoons but instead of using it with younger students this is a friend of mine uh, Dominic McGladdery who's a language teacher from the northeast of England and what he's done he's used uh, comics as a way of uh, introducing a short story by Maupassant to his students so a, uh, a, a short story uh, in French and you'd normally probably uh, suspect that you would be using cartoons with younger students but actually he's got an example here as I can just show you now of he is introducing the uh, the story using Toon Do but for um, for literature so I thought that was a really really nice idea uh, in the sense that you don't have to just use cartoons with younger students even though maybe that would be the sort of the typical domain uh, or the, the typical context in which you'd find cartoons with younger learners why not use it as a way of uh, as a creative way of introducing uh, literature instead so there you go that's a nice example and again you can have a look at his link at the bottom of that particular um, slide okay uh, specifically concentrating now on iPads this is a resource um, Created by uh, David Bohr, uh, which is B-A-U-G-H, um, and David has got two PDF downloads, uh, one to do with uh, general ideas to uh, digital storytelling, and the other one particularly concentrating on using comics to promote digital storytelling. And again, you can just click on uh, on those links, download the PDFs, and have a look at those on an iPad, uh, and get some ideas on good apps and good methods for promoting digital storytelling. Now uh, this is also by David Bohr and he is particularly highlighting certain apps such as uh, Poplet, Comic Live, Pages, etc. Uh, to uh, have a good workflow for um, promoting digital storytelling in the classroom. So as you can see he's talking about uh, planning and creating which I think is very important. I think it's very important to have that planning stage using something like Poplet um, or uh, later on I'm going to suggest that you use an app like Byboard, Byboard HD to Storyboard uh, your uh, your your movie creation you're about to film 
or you could use Comic Live. That might be an interesting way of using maybe a photo story or creating comic uh, with the, the dialogue, et cetera, uh, already and in a comic form, and then turn that into your actual movie, which I think is a really nice idea, or just using pages, which would be this, the equivalent of, say, using Word on a, on a, on a PC or, uh, or what have you. And then he's suggesting using iMovie uh, to create a, 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 a movie, or Sonic Pix for a narrated slideshow. Video Scribe, which you may not know about, is a sort of a screencasting app, which is very useful and very creative. And GarageBand is for your audio. But there are other audio apps, which I'm going to promote uh, later on. And if you buy a brand new iPad, you get a lot of these for free, such as GarageBand and iMovie and Pages, which is pretty um, awesome. And as you can see at the bottom, uh, this idea of sharing uh, using apps such as iFiles, which if you don't know about, it's a brilliant app for file management. There is a free app called uh, Documents, which is worth having a look at as well. But I think um, uh, iFiles is just amazing. It's got me out of many, many different situations about when I want to transfer, let's say, a file from one cloud service such as Dropbox into uh, Google Drive, let's say, or if I want to upload something from my uh, computer onto my iPad, then iFiles is just amazing for that. So I'd really encourage you to have a look at that. Uh, Vimeo is a, is a good place to host a video that you've then created. There are various privacy settings which allow you to make sure that the videos are private so or password protected, uh, which is great. YouTube is, is obvious for a good way of publishing your content. I'm going to be referring to a fantastic example about that later on. And unfortunately, Postures doesn't exist anymore. That was a great way of, of publishing your work to a real audience by sending um, video via email. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore. Whenever, any, whenever a tool is free, we can't guarantee it's going to uh, be around forever. But anyway, that, again, that should, could be a good template for you to think about workflow and how the apps work together in order to, uh, to create uh, some, some good digital storytelling. OK, so what I thought I would do, I've got a quite a few number of, uh, of slides like this one. And what I've done is I've got um, the app in, in, in question, which I think is good for promoting cartoon apps in this, uh, in this context. And I've done QR codes next to each of the apps, which means that if you had an app like Enigma for reading QR codes, you could then uh, scan one of these, um, uh, one of these uh, QR codes. That would allow you to, to go straight to the App Store and download the app. Now, some of these are free and some of them are not free. Um, so we've got Comic Life here. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, top left. Underneath, you've got one called um, Balloon Stickies Free, which allows you to take one image, one photo from your camera roll, and then add a speech bubble to it, which could be useful for uh, digital storytelling. Uh, the one underneath I absolutely love. It's called Toon Camera. That's T-O-O-N-C-A-M-E-R-A, -E Toon Camera, which not only allows you to take a digital photo and digitize it so it looks like a cartoon, so cartoonize if you like a digital photo, you can actually do the same with the video as well. So you can actually either take a video from your camera roll and turn it into a cartoon-like version, or shoot live video as a cartoon, a little bit like the 1985 video Take On Me, which I just think is completely awesome. So if you want to be really creative with this sort of stuff, then uh, you can take that app and you can, uh, you can create your cartoon and then put it together in another app, such as Comic Life or Strip Designer, or another one uh, here, in order to, to create your interesting personalized cartoon with the, with the students. Now, here, the top right one, the one that has a big POW written on it, that's called Strip Designer. And if you again, if you uh, scan the QR code to the right of that, then it will take you straight to the App Store. That's also a very popular app for creating comics. It is, um, it is paid for. You don't have to. It, sorry, it is, it's not free. You have to pay for it. Uh, but I think it's a similar level, a similar amount of money compared to Comic Life. It may be slightly cheaper. I'm not sure. Uh, the one underneath is a free app called um, Comic Maker HD, uh, which is probably one of the best ones I found for creating um, uh, comics with a free app. Uh, there's also a, a very good web tool called Big Huge Labs, which works very well with, uh, with the iPad. And you can upload images and turn them into cartoons as well. You might want to have a, have a look at that one as well. It's called Big Huge Labs. And the one underneath is called Bindle. Uh, which allows you to take photographs, add speech bubbles to them, uh, multiple photographs if you want to, and then you can turn the whole thing into a PDF afterwards, which is pretty cool. And I think it's about a dollar or something like that, 69 pence in England. 
uh, so not not uh, uh, not expensive at all. And occasionally, some of these apps you'll find are one of these uh, free apps for the day. So if you're lucky enough to find Bindle, I know that was one has been free in the past. Uh, sometimes even Toon Camera has been free as well. Uh, that's abs an absolute uh, must-have, I think, if you ever see that one for free. But yes, Bindle could be a useful way of combining photos, making a photo story with speech bubbles, and then turning the whole thing into one PDF. Does it? It does it very, very well. Okay. Oh, I think I missed one. Right now, Animoto is a is an app for creating cool-looking slideshows, and uh, it's not only available as a web tool, but also as an app on uh, iOS as well as for Android. And so it's a nice way of combining lots of different images together, and audio and video and text, and to make this sort of multimedia um, outcome at the end of it. Now, this is an example from uh, Bertram Richter, who is a head of languages at a school in Coventry in the UK, from Tile Hill Wood School. And he uses Animoto a lot to, uh, to showcase or celebrate a language event that's happened at the school. So this particular one, this was um, uh, an event for year seven, eight, and nine, so 11 to 14 year olds. And there was a language event happening at the school, so he took lots of photographs, he got some video, he turned the whole thing into, into a slideshow. I'm not sure if he put some audio on there as well. But uh, you can add um, music from a bank of resources from the website, which is really cool, or from the, uh, or from the uh, iOS version. And uh, he was able to put the whole thing together all in one go. Now, that's, that's brilliant, I think, absolutely brilliant, and a great way of combining lots of different types of multimedia. Multimedia, and that's what I was referring to earlier when I was talking about um, catering to all four skills of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Creating the an the Animoto uh, slideshow is a great example of, of being able to cater to all four skills. Now, a little trick with Animoto, which you may not be aware of, uh, well, this works with other tools as well, but with Animoto, you can only add a certain amount of text with um, the different slides that, have, that are text slides. And a trick um, to get around that is the following: if you create um, a PowerPoint and you want to turn it into an Animoto, what you can do is you can go to File, Save As, as you would do normally, and click on the drop-down menu when it says Save As Type. Scroll down to where it says um, PNG, which is a, a file format for uh, images. Save As PNG, and what will happen is all your slides will be turned into images. And having created your images from your PowerPoint, let's say you've got PowerPoint slides with lots and lots of text on them, you turn those into images, and then you import that into your um, uh, into your uh, Animoto. So, you, so on an iPad, you could do that via Dropbox, for example. So you could upload the images to Dropbox, then open them on the iPad and import them into your camera roll, then into Animoto. Or if you're using the web tool version, you could upload them directly from your desktop to Animoto. So I think that's a really good trick for adding more text uh, into your um, uh, into Animoto. It also could be, I could see from John in the chat, it could also be used uh, for the flipped classroom, but I'm going to talk more about that um, later on as well. Okay, now here are some more um, apps for slideshows in particular. So you've got Animoto on the left-hand side there, the top one, with that sort of uh, uh, aqua blue color. So again, you've got QR codes next to each one, which I think you should find useful. Um, underneath that one, you've got one called Shadow Puppet, which used to be free, interestingly, but now is um, um, $1.99, or that's probably about, what, $3, $4, something like that. So, um, uh, yeah, that's called Shadow Puppet, and that allows you to create a slideshow, but it also allows you to zoom in uh, into individual images to focus on certain as aspects of a photograph and also to add text and, and, and annotation and all the rest of it. Uh, VoiceThread, which has been around for a long time now, since about 2007. Uh, a few years, few years ago now, I think about 2009, they bought an app out for VoiceThread. And that lets you not only combine uh, images and video together, but it also allows you to leave comments, audio comments, text comments, and video comments around that image or around that video. So for things like peer assessment, assess, assessment for learning, it's very good. Uh, the app is free. Uh, you can create VoiceThread for free, but the issue that I have with it is with the free version now, it used, this used to be different a few years ago, but now with the free version, you can't um, create private VoiceThreads. So anything that you create which is free, it must be public, which, and I think I'm right in saying that you can't moderate comments now with the free version. So if you're interested in having it all moderated and what have you, I wouldn't use VoiceThread unless you're willing to pay. Uh, for that, but the app is free, just to make that clear. Now, probably my favorite uh, slideshow app, 
which is free, is this one, uh, top right, which is called 30 Hands, which is a very odd name, really. But anyway, what it allows you to do is to take uh, photographs, put it together uh, in whatever order you want, do annotations over the top of each image, add uh, text as well, uh, add arrows if you want to, and then add a voiceover for each slide and turn the whole thing into a video, which you could then um, save to your camera roll and then you could then import into, a, uh, into an app like Book Creator and make a multimedia, um, multimedia creation using that. So I think that's a really, really fantastic app uh, and it's amazing, it's free. And it does say, um, it, it encourages, encourages you if you want to, to register, uh, but you don't need to register. All that means is if you want to publish on the 30 Hands website, you can do so, but you don't need to. You can skip that step. And when it says publish video, it gives you the option to save to your camera roll without actually publishing it anywhere unless you want to. So that's a really, really good app to, to check out. Underneath that one is one called Pix and Tell which I used to uh, uh, say was my favorite app, but um, recently they used to uh, make it possible to create up to five slides in your slideshow. Um, and having made your five slides, you would, then, uh, you would then turn that into a video and save it to your camera roll, just like 30 hands. But with 30 hands, it's unlimited. You can have as many slides as you want. But then Pixintel decided to make it unlimited, but unfortunately, for the free version I mean, Unfortunately, they decided to put a great big um, watermark on the finished video saying Pix and Tell, which I think is a real shame. So that's why I'm not using that one anymore. I'm using 30 Hands instead, which doesn't have any watermark or, uh, at all. And I hope they don't change it so it does have, because that, uh, that would be a great shame. Underneath is, um, is a very good app for presentations called Haiku Deck, uh, which is H-A-I-K-U space D-E-C-K. And what I particularly like about Haiku Deck is you, you'll do a search for a keyword and it will uh, find images for you which are called Creative Commons license images and that allows you to uh, legally publish them on the web uh, without any, any uh, problems with uh, breaking copyright or what have you. So if you don't know about Creative Commons license images, I'd really encourage you to check them out. I'm going to talk more about that later on. But Haiku Deck incorporates that seamlessly which I just think is just brilliant. And um, recently they've updated it so you can actually edit your Haiku Deck presentations online as well, which makes it even more um, interesting, I think. So I'd really encourage you to have a look at all of those uh, six apps because I'm sure you'll, you'll uh, find them very good. Okay, now you may not think Google Earth is an obvious tool that you could use for digital storytelling, but why not? Now this is a, a blog post from Tom Barrett who used to be a, um, an assistant head teacher in a primary school in Nottingham, but now he's, uh, he's, he's going all over the world with uh, Ewan McIntosh with no Tosh, and he's actually based in Australia now, uh, which is fantastic. But when he was in the classroom, he was um, using Google Earth as one, one aspect of his, of his teaching to encourage digital storytelling. So he was doing the book James and the Giant Peach with his children, and he decided to suggest to them that the story, James and the Giant Peach, or part of the story, was actually taking place in a real uh, area um, in England in, uh, in Google Earth. So he, he, um, he got them to go on a Google Earth tour of the area and then suggest where different parts of the story were taking place, which I just thought was genius uh, and very, very creative and very engaging as a process. So why not think about suggesting that you make up a story um, for promoting creative writing, but using Google Earth as a stimulus. So again, you can you can check out his blog uh, post. He wrote five blog posts all about this, and it's really really inspiring. I think. Uh, so yeah, and obviously you can do that on the iPad with Google Earth, or you could use the web uh, uh, the web version instead. Okay, I've talked about um, Creative Commons a little bit. This is a blog post uh, by Wes Fryer, who is an A-list uh, educator from the U.S., and he, he's talked a lot in the past about uh, Creative Commons license images because I think it's a, it's a really important point if we're going to be doing digital storytelling It's really important that we do use images that legally we're allowed to use rather than just using Google image search Finding any old image and then putting it into our presentation. So I think it's very very important We do try and uh, use Creative Commons license images. So legally we're not breaking copyright So again, if you click on this link, you can see the blog post he's written about using Creative Commons images with uh, with VoiceThread Okay, now you might think to yourself, you know, how do I get started with, with finding good Creative Commons license images? So Flickr is, is an amazing tool for doing this. Uh, Flickr is the most popular uh, website for, for sharing images, for, for uploading images. 
And as opposed to Google Image Search, uh, all the images which are published on uh, on Flickr are pictures that people have, have taken themselves. They're not just, you know, like um, like buttons or web buttons or, or what have you that you might find through a Google Image Search. These are real photographs published by real people. So one could describe that as uh, images with soul, if you like. I've heard that uh, before about Flickr. So if you were to, to go to the link uh, flickr.com forward slash creative commons, as you can see, I'll put a QR code there for you to scan if you want to, and that will take you to, take you to that page. Uh, these are all images which uh, legally you're allowed to use as long as you give attribution or as long as you uh, refer to the um, the guidelines on the sort of towards the middle here. It uh, explains where it says the word briefly and it gives some um, uh, information about each individual license. Uh, as long as you give attribution, then you are you're covering yourself legally. Now, on this page, um, towards the top, it says see more. I don't know if you can see there. It says see more, and if I can see myself, it's about 55. I think that says about 55. 55 million images that legally you're allowed to use uh, in your digital storytelling uh, production. So if you click on see more, and then there'll be another uh, search box that will appear around here. On the on the slide, sort of about um, uh, top uh, to the left a little bit, not the one top right, because if you search in there, you will not get uh, just Creative Commons license images. So if the other search box that appears when you click See More, then uh, you can put in a word, and then you can then find an image, which then comes up. Click on that image, and then on the right-hand side, it will say Some Rights Reserved, and you click on that link, and you can check out exactly what the license agreement is. For that image and then essentially all you need to do is um, download the image if you if you go to where it says um, uh, all sizes uh, if I remember correctly you click on all sizes download the image and then when you use that in your digital storytelling project either put the reference at the bottom of the image or um, at the end in your in a movie so you have like a you have a list of credits so you would need to put the author and the URL where you can find the original um, the, the original image, okay, and that's true not just of images but also of video. For example, on YouTube, you can have Creative Commons license YouTube videos now, which is a fantastic uh, uh, new thing that, I've, that that has happened quite recently. With audio as well, what's called PodSafe Music uh, is Creative Commons license in, like license music. So as long as you say where you got it from, you always check the small print and you give the author, then legally you are absolutely fine. It does have the presumption that the person uploading the content has the legal right to do that, but then that's another whole minefield in itself. If you're not sure, don't use uh, the image. If it looks like it's been produced by a professional artist and someone else has has put uh, has uploaded that, don't use that. But if it's just a, a you know like a like a, a snapshot that you really like, as long as it's Creative Commons, then you'll be absolutely fine. Okay. Now, uh, a good idea if you were to open this website on a um, on an iPad. I'm suggesting that you would tap on the bookmark tool, top left, and you would tap where it says Add to Home Screen. And that is um, what is called a web app. In other words, when you tap on that web app on your iPad, it takes you directly to that web page as a way of finding Creative Commons license images. So it's a good way of getting the students to get used to the idea of having adding CC images to their, uh, to their presentations. Okay? Right, and as you can see, it looks like that in one of the folders. This is the CC Flickr web app that I've highlighted here. I just want to refer quickly to other apps I've got in this folder. The one just above it is called Flow, and that's a good way of finding images um, from Instagram users. They might not be Creative Commons, but uh, if you're not publishing anything, then legally you should be okay. But if you're publishing things, then obviously it's got to be Creative Commons, but that might be a good way of finding resources you can use in lessons. So it's called Flow, and it's free for Instagram users. Pinterest on the left-hand side is amazing for photographs and for good resources for, for um, digital storytelling. In fact, if you do a search for digital storytelling iPads, you'll find lots of interesting posts to do with that. And um, the, the one on the right-hand side, bottom right, is called Wi-Fi Photo Transfer. Wi-Fi Photo Transfer. And this is an amazing app for, for uh, transferring any videos or images from your camera roll onto your PC. So I can't recommend that one highly enough. It's free, and it's just superb. So it's called Wi-Fi Photo Transfer. When you launch it, you get a URL. You put that URL onto your PC, your Mac, etc. 
and then when you click on that on your PC Mac, you can then download any uh, or transfer any images or video from your camera roll, which is just great. And on the left hand side there, bottom left, it says Flick Stacker, and that uh, is an app which allows you to search for Creative Commons licensed images on your iPad directly. And I've got some slides to do with that right now. So this is what it looks like. As you can see, I've done this a little arrow there pointing to Creative Commons. So if you want to search for items uh, in, that are Creative Commons images on the iPad, you can use this directly um, as an app, or you could use the web app I've referred to already. So that's called Flick Stacker. Now here are some more good um, apps for digital storytelling with audio. The one on the left hand side at the top is called Voice Record Pro, and it's my favorite app for audio. It's just amazing because you've got lots of options such as uploading your recordings to, to Dropbox, to Google Drive, uh, to, to SoundCloud, uh, etc. You can uh, record in the background, so you could use the app on the right hand side called Visio Prompt. So you could put your script into the Visio Prompt, have that running, and then one uh, start a recording with um, Voice Record Pro, read the script from Visio Prompt, go back to Voice Record Pro, stop the recording, and then use what's called Edit and Trim. So you can remove the bit at the beginning, the bit at the end, uh, which is useful. At for, for languages, I think, because it might be, you know, someone's lacking in confidence at the beginning and they might, uh, it might take them a little bit of time to get going. And at the end, when they say, was that all right, sir, or was that, was that all right, miss, you can get rid of that bit as well. So you only keep the good stuff from your, uh, from your, uh, your recording, which is just great. So Voice Record Pro, Visio Prompt are, are no-brainers. They're superb. Now, for those people that are really into audio, the one underneath is called Boss Jock Studio. And that one is incredible from the point of view of creating um, instant podcasts. It is, uh, it's not uh, that cheap. It's $6.99, which is probably about $10 or so. But what it lets you do is it lets you have different carts. And you can, in your cart, you can import uh, music or sound effects or backing tracks from Dropbox. Uh, you can set up the carts like a, like a radio station. You tap on the cart to play. You can loop each recording if you want to. And then when you hold your finger down on the microphone um, icon, it will duck the, the music automatically under the audio so that it, uh, it goes quieter, in other words, so you can hear the audio uh, more clearly, the, the voice. And then when you take your finger off the microphone, then the music then plays uh, uh, at, the, at the standard uh, volume. Uh, so if you want to create something which sounds amazing and is, a, is if you like, like an instant um, podcast or radio show, Boss Jock Studio is superb, but it's 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 not a cheap app. It's six ninety nine. So, uh, but you might want to have a look at it. The one on the right of that one is called Keezy, which is K E E Z Y, and that is free. And it's uh, it's a very simple app. You essentially have um, eight different uh, boxes or panels, and you can record audio for each of the box, and then you could use that for storytelling. So you could create sound effects, let's say, while you're reading a story and have the sound of, let's say if it was a story about the Billy Goat's Gruff, and you could make the, the sound of the troll um, uh, licking his lips after, you know, at, underneath the bridge, or the sound of the, uh, the Billy Goat um, uh, clumping across the bridge, and you could do all of that as, as sound effects in Keezy, or you could use it as a way of um, reinforcing or practicing dialogues. So each of the uh, boxes could be a separate utterance or phrase in your dialogue and then play it back as many times as you want. Now you can't export unfortunately with this. So it's just, it, it is what it is. You can, you can record and play back, but you can't export, but maybe they'll introduce that in the future. On the left hand side at the bottom there is one called iPadio, which is a free app available, available for iOS and also for uh, Android as well, and it's a web tool. And you can record up to an hour long of audio, publish it to the web onto your own account, make it public or private, and also, if you tap on the, uh, the download icon so that you get the URL ending in .mp3, so it plays in your browser, you can copy that URL, turn it into a QR code. So when you scan that QR code, uh, it will turn that into an audio QR code. So in other words, you, you create your audio on, iP on iPadio, tap on the download button in the web interface version, uh, turn that URL, which ends in .mp3, into a QR code. And when you scan that, uh, that will play the audio directly. So that could be a way of uh, doing um, speaking homework, having a QR code at the top of a worksheet, which could be listening comprehension, then get the children to, um, or the adults to um, 
answer questions underneath or if you wanted to really go for it you could create a google form which could be marked automatically using a, an action script called Flubaru. so just have your two qr codes one with the audio and one with the uh, with the, uh, the, the, the 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 gap fills and then mark it with Flubaru, and all the answers are sent automatically to the one spreadsheet uh, and it's marked automatically and then each individual uh, student is sent an email telling them the results that they got which is just superb on the the bottom right there is one called soundboard hd uh, if i remember correctly anyway you've got the qr code there to scan it to find uh, it's on the app store and that is similar to keezy but you get more um, blocks to add your audio to and you can add images as well and it's 69 pence so that's what a uh, one dollar or something like that okay so those are some good ones for audio uh, using imovie uh, this is um, languages again so this is sylvia tolisano and she's got some nice ideas on using iMovies with um, images that she's taken pictures of and then turned them into a slideshow. Uh, on the right-hand side uh, is an explanation from Kelda Richards, who is the head of languages in the southwest of England, talking about using iMovie and podcasting with the iPad by using screenshots, which is a really uh, cool idea, I think. Uh, next, we've got storyboarding from languages. So it's a really good idea to storyboard uh, before you do your movie, and then you can then you can set out the different scenes and when I've done training on this, I found that the, uh, the delegates that do storyboarding find it much easier to create a good quality film if they're constantly referring to the structure that they've agreed beforehand in small groups, and it will produce a much better outcome. These are good apps for storyboarding. Uh, Poplet, which I've referred to already, Poplet is great for um, mind mapping, brainstorming, or what have you. Uh, the free version is absolutely fine, so that's Poplet for doing that. The one underneath, which you may not have heard of, is called Byboard, which is B-A-I-B-O-A-R-D, and that is good for uh, collaborative um, whiteboard sharing. So what you can do is you can have Byboard on, on two iPads at the same time. You can share your screen, and you can collaborate on each other's um, iPad. In other words, you could have one page each or work on the same page, so if you draw, a, draw an annotation on one iPad, it will appear on the other iPad as long as they're connected to the same Wi-Fi network. And it's, and it's free and it's brilliant. Um, iMovie I've talked about already. That's a, that's a no-brainer. And the new version of iMovie lets you do other things such as split screen, slow down, speed up the, 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 the animation, uh, the, the, the film you've made. It's just fantastic. If you can't afford to get iMovie, there is a movie app called Loopster, which is of a similar um, has similar features, but it's free. So you might want to have a look at that one, Loopster. The one underneath is called YouTube Capture, and that lets you combine different little uh, video clips together and stitch them together into one video. And also, when you upload to YouTube, you can make it unlisted if you want to, which is good from an educational point of view. And the one underneath that is called Montage, which allows you to um, uh, to shoot um, up to 12 different clips, and each clip cannot be longer than 12 seconds. No, sorry, five seconds. 12 clips at five seconds each or less. And so this is great for creating uh, like a promotional video. And I've I've used it um, in a, in um, a couple of slides in the moment about app smashing, which I'll talk about now. So again, montage. It's an iPhone app, but it works fine on the iPad. So talking of app smashing, I went to, as I, as I referred to earlier, I went to Boston in November to the iPad Summit USA, and I went to the advanced iPad workshop uh, pre-conference session with um, uh, run by Greg uh, Kulewick, uh, who works for um, Etipad, uh, or the EdTech teacher, um, on, uh, on the web and on, on Twitter as well. And you can actually download this EPUB that I created going through what's called app smashing. Now, app smashing is when you combine different apps together to produce an interesting multimedia outcome. And so here, what I've done is I've gone through the process that I did to create my App Smash video. So here you've got all different eight, um, the eight sections that I did. So you may not be able to see this very clearly, but when you download the presentation, then you can see exactly what I did. But essentially, I've used different apps here. The first one was Montage, I've talked about already. I then used an app called Slow Pro to slow down the footage. I then used one called 8mm to put on a uh, sepia type effect onto the video. I then used um, a green screen app called Doink Green Screen and Telegami. So Telegami is a, like, a, like a, a way of producing an avatar with a, uh, video, uh, a video avatar with um, a voiceover and then a background scene. And the background scene I used was that green color, which allowed me on the next slide 
to show you how to use um, Doink uh, Green Screen AMP. So in other words, I was able to have the avatar in the video that I'd created in the background, which is really cool. For a title slide, I used the Hologram app uh, to produce uh, that orange image there. And then I used the Draw and Show um, app to create this sort of um, screencast effect towards the end. And I used Poplet to show all the apps that I'd used. And if you want to watch the video, don't do it right now, but if you wanted to watch it, you could um, uh, scan the second QR code there, the one uh, underneath the first one, which would take you to the YouTube uh, clip that I created. And if you scan the first one, you, it will take you to the EPUB file that I created, and you can then look at that in iBooks on your iPad. Or if you have a Chrome on a PC or a Mac, and you have what's called Readium, which is R-E-A-D-I-U-M, which is a Chrome extension, uh, you're able to upload it to Readium and, and look at it with all the multimedia on your laptop as well if you want to. Okay, these are some good digital storytelling apps. A couple of them I've mentioned already, but I'll just go, to, go through them quickly now. Uh, top left is um, Puppet Pals HD, which is just great, great for promoting uh, speaking in dialogues. You've then got Morpho underneath, M-O-R-F-O. Uh, for the free version, you used to be able to save the video to your camera roll, but you, need, you now need to pay 69 pence to do that, which is very annoying, but, but there you go. So that's good for uh, taking an image and then animating it and doing a voiceover. Telegami I've mentioned already uh, in the previous uh, couple of slides. Uh, top right there is one called Buddy Poke, which lets you have an avatar who could even be doing like the uh, Bang Nam style dancing while uh, saying your voice. You can record your voice and then get the avatar to move. Uh, that one's free. Underneath that one is called I Fun Face, which lets you animate an image. So you can turn um, a, a head on an image into a moving character with your voice. And the one underneath is called Chatterpix, which lets you turn an image into a, an, animated, um, an animated video. In other words, you just need to put a mouth onto the um, uh, onto the the image, and then speak over the top, and it will let, it will speak the object will then speak for you, which is pretty cool, I think. Okay, I've talked a little bit about YouTube, about uploading to YouTube. This is a great example from Kelder Richards, who I've talked about already, called Iska Languages. The YouTube channel YouTube channel is called Iska Languages, so feel free to uh, check that out. So she's published lots of her multimedia digital storytelling examples from her iPad onto YouTube. And so that's a great resource. So these are ones from Morpho, you can see um, there and then. Uh, this is about screencasting apps. This is from um, uh, Laura Knight, who's head of languages at Berkhamsted School in Hertfordshire. And she was using the app called Screen Chomp uh, to create this story in French, as you can see. And the point I want to make here is about the value of publishing to a real audience, because what happened was the makers of Screen Chomp were so impressed by what Laura had done is they left a comment on the blog. So the children were really, really engaged by the fact they'd had some real feedback from the actual company themselves on their use of Screen Chomp on their iPad. So that's the value of publishing to a real audience, I think. Here are some more uh, screencasting apps. The Rolls-Royce of, of screencasting apps is the one top left called Explain Everything. If you don't know about it, I'd really encourage you to have a look at that one. It's fantastic. The best free one that I, I think is the best one anyway that's free is called Show Me, which does similar things to explain everything, but without so many features. What's great about Show Me is you can upload your Show Me to your web resource, to your, 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 your account. You can make the URL private, and then you can turn that into a QR code. So this could be good for uh, digital storytelling, for grammar revision, uh, etc. And you can even download the video via Dropbox to your uh, camera roll as well. Uh, and if you do a search online about downloading your, your Show Me videos, it'll tell you how to do it. The one underneath is Screen Chomp, which I've talked about already. That's um, good for the, the, uh, the way that I've just described. But you can also use it if you had a PDF. You uploaded the PDF to Screen Chomp and then did video feedback over the top of the PDF. Likewise with Show Me, you could take a picture of a child's piece of work and give video feedback using Show Me and then send them the URL of your video. Uh, top right there, you've got Educreations, which is similar to Show Me and Screen Chomp. You've got Doodlecast Pro underneath. And then the one that I used for app smashing, which was, um, I've forgotten the name right now, I think it's, uh, 
whatever anyway um not show and tell but it's uh, in, um anyway um that's that's also a really good one as well uh for screencasting okay right for uh, nearly finished for uh ebooks the best one uh that's out there on the app store is called book creator there is a free version it's uh it has all the same features as the full version which is i think about uh three or four pounds or five five dollars or so and you can uh Create multimedia ebooks, including images, text, audio, annotations, video, etc. So it's a great way of combining everything together into a final ebook. And with a full version, you can combine different ebooks into one mighty ebook. So you could have different students work on different books and then combine them all together. The one underneath is called My Story, which is very nice, particularly good for primary level students, I would say. And you can draw lovely pictures with their very interactive interface uh, and also create an ebook from that. Uh, on the right hand side at the bottom you've got Creative Book Builder, which is good, but is, is not as good in my opinion compared to Book Creator, because I find the Book Creator is just so much easier to use from the point of view of the interface. And then the one at the top there is what you need for reading the ebooks or displaying them, which is called iBooks, which is free uh, from Apple. Okay, um, I've talked a lot about QR, or I've shown, shown a lot of QR codes already. Uh, the article on the left-hand side is, is um, exploring the educational potential of QR codes. I didn't put the URL underneath. If you just do a search for that title, you'll find it. And that's given uh, lots and lots of ideas about how you can use QR codes in the classroom. And on the right-hand side there is one I wrote for The Guardian in 2012, which explains how to use a QR code with Show Me in order to uh, reinforce a grammar point, which you might find useful as well. And finally, this is iBooks Author. If you're really into the idea of creating eBooks and you have a Mac, then you could use iBooks Author uh, to create your own eBook, which gives you many, many more opportunities, such as putting in drag and drop elements or having a little quiz, that sort of thing. It is free, but you have to have a Mac to be able to produce it. And then the, uh, the eBooks that you produce uh, can be seen on an iPad, uh, obviously. And uh, on the right hand side there, this is a complete guide to using iBooks Author, but on the left-hand side is an example from um, Joseph Picardo, who used to be head of languages in Nottingham, is now an assistant head teacher down in London, and he used it in order to create uh, an e-book on the um, Spanish Civil War about Franco, and what a great way of combining different multimedia elements together and then produce a fantastic re revision resource for his students. Okay, and to finish off with, I just wanted to reinforce the idea that I said right at the beginning about Bloom's Taxonomy and creating. This uh, is an image from Wes Fryer, A-list educator from the US, uh, who's given this very useful infographic describing different ways in which we can use iPads to, uh, to create content, such as interactive writing, ebooks, podcasting, five photo stories, all of which relate to digital storytelling. But the question I would like to leave you with today is what do you want to create today? In other words, how are you going to use web tools or iPad apps in order to create good content uh, to enhance language learning? Obviously, that's what it's, it's all about, about the pedagogy. Okay, and on the, then on the right-hand side are two presentations from Sylvia Tolosano again, from languages.org, uh, on interesting ways in which you can use iPads to enhance um, uh, teaching and learning. Okay, and that's what I wanted to say. So if you want to download this whole presentation as a PDF, I I'm, think I'm right in saying that we're going to make it available as well as a PowerPoint for you to download. Um, you can download the whole thing now. I want to make it clear for those people who are watching live, uh, if you want to access the, the uh, recording of the webinar, you have to be a Belter member. If you are not a Belter member, I suggest that you take a screenshot of this right now or scan it right now and then you've got a permanent copy because unless you become a member, you won't be able to watch the, the, the recording. And I know I've gone slightly over, but I hope you'll let me off for that. And uh, I know it's been a lot of information, but it has, you've got the whole presentation there as a PDF, you've got the whole recording, and I hope you found it useful. And if you're interested in finding out more about the sort of work I do, just let me know, and I'll be more than happy to, to come and do some workshops or do other conference talks or what have you. So I can see that Malou has now come on, and so I'll stop talking and hand over to Malou. But thank you for your time, everybody, and I hope you found that useful. So I'd like to thank all of you for coming to this Delta webinar and of course to Joe for that interesting presentation. Uh, if you'd like to know more about Delta, remember to visit our website, Facebook and Twitter pages. 
Again, don't forget about our Belta Day in March, and be sure to join us on the 23rd of February for our next webinar. webinar. New Bello will be here to discuss the lexical approach. Again, thank you all for attending.